In October of 2015, the El Faro cargo ship was lost in the Bermuda Triangle during a deadly Atlantic storm. Ten months later, when the black box of El Faro was finally salvaged using state-of-the-art sonar and robotic technology, crucial details finally began to emerge about how and why the El Faro cargo ship sailed into the eye of Hurricane Joachim and sank with 33 men and women on board. As the sun set on the evening of September the 28th, 2015, the sea was calm as cargo ships prepared to set sail from Jacksonville, Florida. But national weather forecasters in Miami had already noticed a low pressure system southwest of Bermuda that looked like the onset of a tropical storm. On the morning of September the 29th, the American commercial freighter El Faro left this port with 33 crew aboard. They would never be seen again. I don't know and I don't think anybody will know what the captain was thinking during those last minutes, but the crew is probably terrified and wishing they were home, you know. You can't tell me that sitting at a dock for one day, losing money, is better is is better than is 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 uh is not better than going out in the sea losing 33 lives. Just doesn't make any mathematical sense. It doesn't make any moral sense, and uh, it just doesn't make any ethical sense. It, it just doesn't make any sense. It's it's ridiculous. The El Faro was carrying 400 containers of fresh and frozen groceries, as well as cars and trailers, due to be delivered to Puerto Rico. The El Faro was on a regular voyage between Jacksonville, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico, and it made this trip every week. It would take loaded containers, mostly refrigerated containers, from the U.S. East Coast out of Jacksonville, and it would supply most of the food products that went to Puerto Rico, including frozen chicken, produce, and pharmacy products, and the kinds of things you'd buy at Walgreens and CVS. So it was down making its weekly voyage to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and there was a hurricane coming up the Caribbean toward Jacksonville. A tropical storm dubbed Joaquin by weather experts was already brewing in the Atlantic. But the ship's captain, Michael Davidson, decided to leave anyway, setting what he thought was a safe course 64 miles south of the storm's predicted path. Now they had two choices. They could have chosen, first of all, to go the short route, or they could have chosen to go the Grand Bahama Canal, which would have added another 12 hours or so to the trip. And the captain made the decision to go the short route, and that turned out to be a very fateful decision. It turned out to be the decision that caused the ship to be in the eye of the hurricane and eventually sink. At 240 meters long, the El Faro was a behemoth that would have had no problem sailing through rough seas. The ship was one of the oldest being operated by Tote Maritime, and unlike most modern ships, still was outfitted with boilers and steam engines that were often in need of repair. On the evening of the 30th, the ship had already moved into an area of gale-force winds, which would soon become hurricane-force conditions. The last ship to see the doomed El Faro was its sister ship, El Yunque, also on the Puerto Rico route. By the next day, Joaquin had exploded into a Category 4 storm with gusts of 240 kilometers an hour and rough seas. It had become Hurricane Joaquin and had also changed course, moving southwest 
right toward El Faro. Hurricane Joachim filled the morning news shows. A ship's captain who sailed the same route for more than 12 years saw the bulletins and grew concerned, so sent a text message to Captain Davidson to make sure he knew about the storm. There was a second mate who worked on the El Faro who actually was off duty. And he's up in Massachusetts sitting on this couch watching the Today Show or the weather broadcast. And he actually has cell phone service. And he calls the captain up and says, Captain, you know, you have a hurricane bearing down on you and you have some options. You can turn at such and such a channel and go through the Bahamas and avoid this hurricane. And the captain said, no, you know, I think I'm OK. I think I'm going to be able to skirt south of the hurricane. And that was an error in his, uh, his judgment. When you're at sea and a storm arises, then that's when your professional skills come into play. You know, you have to navigate that vessel around and out of the storm. And I've done that several times. I've been a part of a navigation team that has had to go sometimes 600 miles out of the way to avoid a storm because we were already at sea. You can't control Mother Nature. But you can control a ship from leaving a dock going into a hazardous situation. I think people need to understand that it's very rare for a ship to sink in these days and all the crew to be lost. It's unusual for an American ship to have this happen because of the high degree of regulation of American ships. So no, this is a very unusual event. Um, it's also not usual for a ship to sail in such a way that it would sail through the center of a hurricane. I mean, ships this day and age use weather routing and use other techniques to avoid hurricanes. And uh, typically, uh, a ship that was out in the ocean would not come this close to a hurricane. Uh, while I was in the Coast Guard, um, we were sent uh, into a hurricane to perform a rescue. Well, um, how do I say this nicely? I was young and dumb <laughs> and believed that um, I was in the Coast Guard and we could do anything. And we actually did weather the storm. So. The belief was possibly correct, but looking back on it, um, it was rather dangerous. Commercial ship captains are often under enormous pressure to make on-time deliveries, even foregoing crucial repairs that might delay an arrival or departure. Their careers are often on the line. And when you suddenly in the middle of a voyage say, we're not going to be able to make that scheduled arrival time, you as the captain are under close scrutiny because on-time arrivals are a big thing with a service, a liner service like Tote that runs on such a regular basis. If he had chosen a different route, if he had gone between the Bahamas and Florida, the voyage would have taken longer and therefore would have cost more money, but it would have been a lot safer. Danielle Randolph was a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy and the second mate on the ship at the time. She emails to her mother literally hours before the ship sank, pray for us, we're sailing into the eye of the hurricane. So the members of the crew knew that they were doing something that was extraordinarily dangerous. And nevertheless, uh, the captain refused to either turn around or otherwise alter his course to avoid running through the eye of the hurricane. By early morning on October the 1st, conversations on the bridge reveal the ship was taking on water. The captain used the ship's satellite phone to call Tote Maritime. Incredibly, despite the fact that its ship was in a hurricane, there was no answer. So he left a message. We have a navigational incident. Um, I'll keep it short. A uh, scuttle popped open on two decks and we were at some free communication of water go down the three, three old. Had a pretty good list. I want to uh, just touch and contact you verbally here. Everybody's safe, uh, yeah, but I want to talk to you. Then, only an hour later, at 7.20 a.m. on October the 1st, the ship's captain made an SOS emergency call to the ship's owner. Yes, ma'am. My name is Michael Davidson. Ship's name? El Faro. Spell that? E-L? Oh, man. The, t the, the clock is ticking. Can I please speak with a QI? El Faro. 
I have a marine emergency and I would like to speak to a QI. We had a, a, a hull breach, a scuttle blew open during a storm. We have water down in three holes with a heavy lift. We've lost the main propulsion unit. The engineers cannot get it going. Can I speak with a QI please? The El Faro lost power. So what we know is shortly after losing power, she started to lay broadside to the seas and the wind. We also know the ship was taking on water through some hatch covers. Uh, the water that was coming in was causing something called free surface effect, which increases temporarily the uh, tilt that the ship is experiencing, the list. That's actually what probably caused the El Faro to sink in the long run is a combination of uh, vertical center of gravity, uh, the waves pushing the ship hull over, and the free surface effect. For whatever reason, the engines fail. And once a ship is in a storm like that and the engines fail, it's at the mercy of the wind and the waves. So it'll go broadside to the waves, it'll start rolling more and more, and then eventually it'll just roll over on its side and take on water and sink. Without a powered propeller, the helpless El Faro risked being sucked into the eye wall of a Category 4 hurricane. Tote Maritime and the Coast Guard were soon in touch, and a course was plotted for Davidson to try to steer into shallow waters and seek shelter in the small islands near the Turks and Caicos. But when they called El Faro's satellite phone to give the orders to Davidson, there was no answer. The Coast Guard C-130 aircraft sent out to look for the ship during the hurricane encountered the worst weather the crew had ever experienced, risking their lives to search for the lost ship. There had been no communication with the Coast Guard before the cargo ship El Faro, with its 33-member crew, went missing near Crooked Island in the Bahamas during Hurricane Joachim. However, it was not uncommon for ships to lose communications in a storm. The Coast Guard and families waited as concern mounted by the minute. Kenneth Benton is a merchant seaman who had been on sea watch on El Faro the week before. He had been on the sister ship, the El Yonke, that day to pick up some extra hours of work. He had been in the Tote Maritime office where tension was rising. Once I realized that we were, you know, had a, you know, storm in the area, a hurricane in the area, uh, it kind of concerned me that, you know, they hadn't made contact. I asked the captain, was everything all right? And he said, oh, well, we can't contact the El Faro. I'm like, wow, well, maybe the antennas blew off or something like that. And uh, what really became disturbing is when they told me that uh, the EPIRB had went off. It blipped sent off one blip and then there was no more. Well, the U.S. Coast Guard had gotten some ambiguous signals from the, uh, from the El Faro. They had gotten a single ping on what's called an EPIRB, an emergency uh, positioning radio beacon. And why only a single ping? That's one of the unanswered stories here. Uh, the EPIRB is supposed to float free when a ship sinks, and it's supposed to issue continuous pings until the battery wears out. LaShawn Thomas was an oiler who worked in El Faro's engine room. He had been sailing for 13 years. His stepdad, Pastor Bob Green, remembers when he found his calling. I remember the first time that, that he actually sailed abroad. Um, he called me from London, England, and I often tell the story about he called me, he said, Pops, I'm walking down the streets of London, England, talking to you over the phone. He said, this is amazing. He said, I'm never going back. It was the moment that LaShawn Thomas realized he was experiencing what the maritime community refers to as having salt in your blood. The old school sailors, or the salty dogs, like they say, they call it having salt in your blood. Once you get the salt in your blood, you know, you're, uh, you, have a, you have a desire to go out on the ocean. You know, I mean, this, this, being on land will get boring after a while, you know. I mean, um, you know, and I, 
you know, it doesn't take long to get the salt in your blood, you know. A few years, a couple of years, two or three years, the lifestyle, the adventure, it's, uh, it's nothing that can compare to it. LaShawn had sailed 13 years when he left port for Puerto Rico on El Faro. It was his last voyage. We were, my wife and I were walking into a restaurant um, just out to dinner routinely. And the phone rang and, and she stopped as we were going through the door and kind of slowed down as she answered. But as what happened next, I was, I was it was just sort of unimaginable. It, it was just, it was horrifying to know that they had lost communication, they had lost the location, and, and they were actually trying to figure out where the ship was at this point. As the hours passed, Tote had to admit its ship had been lost near Crooked Island. And of course, we're going to talk about now Hurricane Joaquin. What's the latest? What's happening with Joaquin right now? We've got to watch the future progress on Joaquin. A Category 4, the intensity hasn't really changed from the last advisory. This morning, Hurricane Joaquin is lurching north after lashing the Bahamas with intense winds and sheets of rain. And now a cargo ship with Americans on board has gotten caught up in the powerful storm and is lost at sea. The Coast Guard sent out a C-130 on a search and rescue mission. The Coast Guard HC-130 Hercules has a wingspan of 40 meters and a service ceiling of 10,000 meters. This aircraft has been tried and tested in every war zone and in the toughest conditions. My name is Lieutenant Burden, Coast Guard pilot that just finished flying into Hurricane Joaquin, searching for the vessel El Faro. Our search took us within 50 nautical miles of the eye of the storm. At 1,000 feet, the winds were in excess of 100 knots. Visibility was less than one quarter mile. Cloud ceilings were at 1,000 feet, and the wave height was in excess of 40 feet. Turbulence was moderate, causing the aircraft to climb and descend around 150 feet with airspeed deviations of 20 knots. This was the most challenging weather conditions anyone on our crew had ever flown in. It turned out El Faro wasn't the only ship caught off guard by Hurricane Joaquin. North of Haiti, the smaller cargo vessel Minouche began to sink in heavy weather. The U.S. Coast Guard safely rescued all 12 crew members from a life raft late on October the 1st. But there was no sign of life from El Faro. Several hours later, I came to my union hall and the Coast Guard was there saying that they had been conducting a broad range uh, flyover of, the, uh, of a grid where they think the last uh, ship was last located and there was nothing. So I knew that uh, something was wrong, you know, and I was just hoping that maybe they <clears throat> had been blown so far off course that they were just sh searching the wrong grid, you know, and uh, turned out that wasn't the case at all. The Coast Guard searched through October 2nd without success. At dawn on October the 3rd, search and rescue responders spotted a number of objects they believed belonged to the El Faro. They narrowed their search to a 582 square kilometer field. The very first thing they found was a large oil slick. Now the oil slick is significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, Oil seeps very slowly from a sinking ship that's intact. The only place the oil can basically come out is through the tank vents, and the tank vents are fairly small. So if you have a huge oil slick when, where a ship sank right at the beginning, that tends to indicate that the hull ruptured at some time. First, a life ring was found and recovered. Then came a more distressing sighting, an orange survival jacket. We lowered a rescue swimmer into the water. Uh, that person confirmed that the, the body was deceased. It was unidentifiable. So we needed to quickly move to other reports of life. And the reason we have to do that is 
The ocean is not a static being. It's alive, it's dynamic, it's constantly moving. So when we have reports of other life rafts, rife boats, uh, we need to get out there and quickly identify them, see if there's any signs of life. Because if we don't do that right away, then it could sink, it could disappear, we might not be able to relocate it. So again, our focus is on survivors. That's our mission. They found one body inside one suit. They did not recover the body because it was somebody who's deceased and they needed to maximize their time in the air to search for survivors. And, and I don't fault that decision at all. But when they went back to try to find that body, they never did. As the news spread, seamen and their families braced for the worst. The tight-knit maritime community held vigils. It was very sad. A lot of tears, a lot of emotion, a lot of anger, um, a lot of hugs and handshakes, a lot of prayers, um, a lot of a lot of drinking, you know, in the city, you know, as far as the seamen and families, you know, trying to just uh, make sense of, uh, I guess, trying to numb ourselves to the reality of what was to come. Kenneth Benton knew the crew well. The maritime community is tight, and many of the sailors are not tied to specific vessels, so end up working together. There was one that I, that I was my good friend, my buddy. Yeah, uh, his name was uh, Roosevelt Clark. He left behind, you know, three or four kids, you know, uh, uh, a mother, you know, his mother, you know, uh, who really depended on him. He was, uh, he was the type of guy that, if there was anything he needed to know about shipping, he knew all the ins and outs. You know, he knew about the, the payroll and when to write down hours and how to write it so that you don't have any discrepancies. It was just a big help, you know, it was just like having a, 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 a guardian angel sometime, you know, on the vessel, you know. The El Faro's operators, tote maritime, were questioned for hours on end. Meanwhile, business went on as usual, with El Faro's sister ship continuing to sail the route where El Faro had been lost. We were angry because they felt helpless. They were angry at the company for not using better judgment, for not taking the the lives of the sailors as more of a concern than the cargo getting on time to where it was where it was going and uh there was a lot of anger because it seemed like there was uh, a great effort by some to sort of uh, mute anyone who wanted to speak out you know about the uh tragedy the National Transportation Safety Board contracted with the U.S. Navy to find the missing ship and, more importantly, its voyage data recorder. They'll be examining the wreckage which has been recovered during the search and the rescue phase of this operation and also further wreckage as it becomes available. Our human performance team is hard at work gathering personnel records and scheduling interviews. And to clarify, up to this point, the Coast Guard has been conducting search and rescue operations. The Coast Guard equipment that is used for search and rescue is different from the equipment that will be used to locate the vessel and the voyage data recorder. We are coordinating with the United States Navy to bring in that equipment. The USS Apache was sent out on October the 19th from Little Creek, Virginia, to begin searching the wreckage and debris field for the lost El Faro. It was fitted with state-of-the-art underwater detection equipment and sonar. On October the 23rd, after arriving at the last known position of El Faro, specialists on board placed a towed pinger locator, known as a TPL, into the water and began slowly traversing the area in a preset search pattern in hopes of picking up the telltale ping sounds from El Faro's voyage data recorder. The U.S. Navy operates the TPL-25, which weighs 32 kilos and is 76 centimeters long. It is towed below a layer of seawater known as the thermocline, where the warmer surface water meets the colder deep water, creating a wall of water that reflects sound upwards or downwards 
according to where the source is located. To capture a signal from the bottom of the sea, the TPL has to be towed in the cooler deep water below the thermocline. The TPL was withdrawn and instead the Apache put the sophisticated side scanning sonar system called Orion in the water to try to find El Faro using sonar technology. It is towed behind the support ship at a speed of as little as two kilometers an hour. It is three meters long, one meter wide and one meter high and weighs more than one and a half metric tons. Sonar technology creates images by processing reflected sound waves that are sent out by side scan sonar. These are then converted into a video image. For three weeks, the Apache searched, sweeping the sea floor and finally narrowing its field of exploration to 500 square kilometers. Until, on October the 31st, at last a side sonar scan revealed the dark shadow of a ship. The vessel was located at a depth of four and a half thousand meters, not far from El Faro's last known position, 39 nautical miles from Crooked Island. To positively identify the wreckage, specialists on Apache sent down the Curve 21, a deep ocean remotely operated vehicle. The inspection equipment dived down into the dark, cold depths, more than four kilometers beneath the surface of the sea. What the remotely operated camera saw made headlines nationwide. Twisted, crushed and scattered remains. The top wheelhouse deck sheared off the rest of the superstructure. A catastrophic structural failure. One month after the American cargo ship El Faro disappeared without a trace near the Bahamas in Hurricane Joaquin, the sunken vessel was finally located sitting at the bottom of the sea, four and a half thousand meters deep by the US Navy. To find El Faro, the Navy used the Curve 21 sub, specially designed for deep water salvage. Weighing nearly three tons, the state-of-the-art remotely operated vehicle, ROV, can work up to 6,000 meters underwater. It usually operates together with the Orion vessel as a single integrated search and recovery system, based on a fiber optic umbilical cable and a shared handling process that can switch at sea between side scan sonar and ROV operations. The ROV can be controlled in all six degrees of motion and adjusts itself according to depth, attitude and heading. It has a CTFM sonar for locating its target and then detecting it with pings. It sends back images in high resolution from a digital still camera, black and white and color television cameras. How does it work? The system includes a load-bearing, pressure-compensated, electro-optical umbilical swivel. The whole system of fiber optics can combine up to eight different channels of video, sonar, USBL, RS-232, 422, 485 data communications and navigation data on a single fiber. A digital communication network with 400 megahertz data capacity controls the vehicle and can be customized to work with all sorts of tailor-made salvage tools. The camera images of El Faro being sent back presented a big salvage problem. The navigation bridge structure and deck below had been sheared off, along with the mast and its base, where the voyage data recorder was mounted. For weeks after locating El Faro, 4,500 meters below the sea on October the 31st, the Navy searched the seafloor looking for the crucial parts of the ship that had separated from the main wreck when it sank. Two weeks later, on November the 11th, the navigation bridge was found, but the mast and the VDR were still missing. After five more days with no luck, the search was called off. The bridge ripped off of the ship. 
Um, now typically the bridge deck is solidly welded to the house and it should remain intact. When a ship falls through water though, it falls very, very rapidly. It's, it's not so different than a piece of steel falling through the air. And so consequently this ship picked up speed as it was going to the bottom and the water pressure against the hull was so much that it actually ripped the bridge deck off. So the bridge deck landed someplace different than where the hull landed. In the spring of 2016, the NTSB turned to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for help locating the Voyage Data Recorder, a device roughly the size of a basketball in a 35 square kilometer debris field. The WHOI used two unmanned submersibles, the Sentry, which produces high resolution maps of the sea floor, and an observation vehicle known as Camper which is a camera sled providing a real-time video link to the research vessel Atlantis above. First, they surveyed the entire area before methodically homing in on possible locations for the recorder. Finally, the mast was located. The Navy managed to detach the capsule from the mast of the ship without damaging it and then bring it up to the surface. It was a miracle salvage of a key piece of the El Faro puzzle. The device includes a voice data recorder that records conversations on the bridge. The authorities were able to retrieve a crucial 26 hours of information, including audio, weather and navigational data. I think the tapes are going to provide a timeline. And once you have a good timeline, you can start to fit pieces in. Will we ever know the complete answer? I don't think so. But I think finding and being able to recover the, the recorder is a big step in finding out what happened. The incredible salvage of the Voyage data recorder proved crucial to understanding what happened to the El Faro. The recording began about 5.37 a.m. on September the 30th, 2015, about eight hours after the El Faro had left port from Jacksonville. By the morning of October the 1st, the master and crew were discussing flooding and the vessel's list. At 6.13 a.m., the vessel's loss of propulsion and flooding was mentioned on the bridge audio. A telephone call was also recorded in which the captain notified shoreside personnel of the vessel's critical situation. He was preparing to abandon ship. He said that they quote unquote lost the plant. Well, lost the plant is a very ambiguous term. That could mean that they just lost electricity. It could mean that they've lost propulsion or it could mean that they lost both propulsion and electricity. It was less than 20 minutes later, we know from the tapes that the abandoned ship signal was finally given. Um, and we don't have any other communications between that phone conversation with the designated person ashore and everybody abandoning a ship. The captain had interesting authority. He had life and death authority. Uh, we were used to letting the captain make all the decisions. That's how we arrived at this law. We don't actually have a regulatory approach to say, nope, you're done. Now, when we come inside port waters, Yes, the Coast Guard has the, uh, the regulatory authority to say, you can't leave, you can't enter, you're tied up, or you have to leave. But once the boat's underway, no. So I think he was afraid. I think he was afraid that if he simply turned the ship around, that he was going to be in the bad graces of Tote, and that was going to adversely affect his career. And when you know you're, you're in your late 40s or early 50s, and the only thing you've ever known is to be a ship's officer or a ship's captain, and that's not available anymore, that's a tough place to be in life. There aren't an awful lot of transferable skills that you can use from being a ship's captain to being in a shoreside job. According to the NTSB, the data recorder shows the captain sounded the alarm and ordered abandoned ship at 7.30 a.m. on October the 1st, 2015. 
The recording ended 10 minutes later, as El Faro sank 39 miles northeast of Crooked Island, Bahamas. They didn't get off the vessel. They, they sounded the alarm to abandon ship. But when they looked out that window or tried to open up the, you know, one of the, one of the watertight doors, you're talking about a category four or five hurricane. Now, I was in 70 knot winds. They were in 160 knot plus winds, 160, 180 knot plus winds. I mean, you can't even stand up in that, let alone to try to don a, a, a what we call a Gumby suit or a water survival suit. You're gonna blow like a balloon, you're gonna blow off. But when I think about it, you know, 12 months after, what the FRO went through, what the crew went through, it would send chills up my arm, you know, and uh, instantly make me just shed tears, just thinking about the horror that they saw or in, in their experience. The sinking of the El Faro was a chain of events, and blame can't be placed on one single factor alone. Many different actions might have prevented the accident. It was so routine for ships to sail toward uh, what could be heavy weather, there could be storms, knowing and anticipating evasive actions. And I think if we, t if we get anything else out of this whole incident, it should be that we can't roll the dice with Mother Nature. I think that the El Faro um, illustrated very clearly that the um, shoreside management needs to ensure that the vessel management uh, understands that it's okay to say no. And there are times when they should say no. The ship could have been sturdier. Like its sister ship, El Yunque, El Faro was often being repaired and was nearing the end of its life cycle at sea. In Marine Board hearings held in early 2016, Tote maritime executives were grilled extensively about safety standards and the ship's age and vulnerabilities. One former ship captain testified that he had many concerns about the safety of El Faro. I, I think any time that you are pushing a ship to 40 years of age, you are asking for trouble. And a ship flexes. It, it, it hogs and it sags as it's loaded and it's discharged. And those cycles fatigue the steel and cause the welds to break and welds to be less strong than they would be. And then you take a ship that's had this 40 years of, of hogging and sagging and flexing and you subject it to a hurricane and, and things start coming apart. Well, the age of the vessel certainly counts because um, of several factors, one of which is the design. Uh, we are getting better in design than we were 30 years ago. Uh, second is construction, uh, the steel, gets a little thinner as rust and corrosion take effect. The 40-year-old vessel had open lifeboats, outdated compared to the enclosed lifeboats of modern ships, which would have increased the chance of survival. The other thing that happens is the lifeboats become virtually unusable. The, the lifeboat to the side to which the ship is listing is hanging so far away from the side of the ship that you can't get into it. The other lifeboat, on the other side is sliding down the hull of the ship, which makes it very, very difficult to get into and launch. So this listing problem renders the primary life-saving gear on the ship basically useless. The ship was also due for maintenance, but before departure, Tote had put off repairs on the boilers, engines, and structural welding until the next month, when El Faro was due to be retired from the Puerto Rico crossing. It was old, and um, above the main deck, there's there's uh, portholes in the boat that are that are that are probably about the size of a car door and window, and they go all around, you know, starboard the starboard side and the port side, and uh, you know, I think what I think happened, water got into that got into that, and waterlogged, you know, the vessel, and. Um, 
you know, that was, uh, it weighted it down, lost propulsion, hurricane in the eye of a hurricane, there's no chance. I mean, there's no chance to survive that, you know. Crew members and dock workers alike complained about the lack of safety on El Faro, which had been retrofitted in an Alabama shipyard in 1993. The process, called jumboization, as seen here in a European shipyard, involves adding a mid-body section to a ship to make it bigger. The El Faro had been lengthened by 28 meters. The Marine Board of Investigation has questioned the vessel's stability and whether there were mistakes in weather forecasting or cargo loading before the ship's final voyage. The presence of the oil slick is, is certainly significant. When they actually went out there a little later, they found two separate oil slicks separated by a substantial distance. Um, well, what does that mean? Well, you might suggest that one of the oil slicks happened when the ship broke up on the surface, and the second oil slip occurred, slick occurred when the ship hit the bottom three miles beneath the ocean's surface. It wasn't the first or the last time the company sent its ships to Puerto Rico with hurricanes passing through. We had a hurricane in Florida that uh, came up the East Coast called uh, Hurricane Matthew. And uh, this same company, Tote, sent a vessel, you know, out to sea to go from Jacksonville to Puerto Rico during the midst of this hurricane. You know, they went, they say they went out of the way to dodge it, but my opinion is why not wait a day and let the storm pass and then go out? It just makes sense, but I guess it makes too much sense to do it that way. Or either there's too much money to be lost if you don't get the product there on time. That's the only, that's the only reason why my shipmates from the El Faro 33 are, are, are are in a, uh, that's the only reason why they perished, because money was more important. For mariners and grieving family members of the El Faro crew, hard questions remain unanswered by Tote. When is the maritime industry going to adopt something like the airline industry has? The airline industry, if, if there's bad weather, they ground the airplanes. No matter how much Delta or American wants to take off and make that money by flying these passengers, you know, 400 miles away, if the FAA says nobody's flying, then nobody's flying until the storm passes. But in the maritime industry around the world, not just the U.S. fleet, it's up to the company. The companies police themselves, and that needs to be taken away. The Marine Board of Investigation is expected to release its findings in 2017. In the meantime, representatives of the families of the El Faro victims are continuing to fight for updated maritime safety laws and tougher regulatory oversight for vessels headed out to sea. The families would like to see the ship salvaged and the remains of their loved ones returned. Or, at the least, be allowed to hear audio of what was happening on the bridge. Uh, we, we really hope to hear the recordings. I, I, I was kind of torn as to whether I would or wouldn't want to hear that or experience or relive the moments and hear the, the voices of the men there. But, I, but at the same time, I'm sure that there was an air of professionalism, there was an air of confidence and uh, their abilities and their, their techniques and everything probably is what shone through more than anything, I, I would imagine. Well, who better to listen to voices and determine what it is they're saying than a family member who's been listening to the voices of these people their entire life? So it seems to me it would make a lot of sense for the NTSB to allow 
family members to listen to these recordings and try to interpret what it is that's being said on the recordings that they can't decipher. A memorial fountain and obelisk have been built in Jacksonville Cemetery to honor the 33 men and women who perished on the El Faro. Today, it remains a peaceful place for the families and loved ones of mariners to come and remember the 33 brave men and women whose lives were needlessly lost at sea in Hurricane Joachim.